thanks, Andre, for the introduction, and uh, thanks everyone for hanging around. Um, I'm going to move from within the cell to the cell membrane. And uh, I'm a fluid mechanician at heart, and uh, you'll see some of that uh, come through in the way I talk about this. And uh, I'm from UC Davis, as Andre said, I'm mostly in the chemical engineering department, but I also have a leg in the graduate programs in applied math and biophysics. So you'll see that a lot of the uh, flavor of the things I do um, are in the border of these three domains. Okay, so I'm going to look at the fluid, uh, fluid mechanics of a membrane. So this audience does not need an introduction to the cell membrane. This is something that's in every eukaryotic cell. And uh, a lot of work has gone into determining the structure and the properties of this, uh, this entity, this kind of quasi two-dimensional entity. What I like to point out, however, is that it's not, uh, it's not uniform. It's what we know is that it has its own moduli of bending and shearing, but it's also fluid in the plane of the membrane. And it's not um, empty in the sense that there's got, there, there are things in it. There are proteins, there are ion channels, there are polymers, there are attachments, there are active and passive entities that live within this membrane, move within this membrane and exert stresses. And what we now know is that the hydrodynamics of the membrane lipid itself plays a key role in determining their transport properties and potentially also their long range interactions within the membrane. So it's the second part that I'll mostly focus on today. And uh, from a um, very big picture point of view, the, uh, the way to think about it come, goes back to um, Singer and Nicholson in the 70s, followed by you know, fluid calculations from Safman and others thinking of this as a mosaic, a two-dimensional field, a continuous phase field, which has its own viscosity, a membrane viscosity, within which are suspended uh, things. So you can, if you're coming from the suspension mechanics world, you can interpret this as a quasi two-dimensional suspension, where you might have particles suspended in a 2D fluid. However, it's not quite 2D in the sense that while you're only allowed to move in the plane of the membrane, you're constantly um, transferring momentum to the phase around you. So it, that, that's where the subtlety arises. In our group, we look at this from a particulate hydrodynamics point of view. And um, there are various aspects that we look at. For example, the fact that this membrane is not a nice clean fluid has consequences. From a fluid mechanics point of view, we would call that a non-Newtonian membrane. And what that means is that if you have things that are trapped within the membrane and if they move relative to each other, they, they show kind of non-trivial motion and we have methods of analyzing that. I'll show you maybe one teaser slide at the end about a recent publication where we dig deep into the calculation of the uh, disturbance field associated with particles trapped in a non-Newtonian membrane. You could have uh, things trapped in the membrane that are active. Now this is going to be the primary focus of today's talk. These could be molecular motors, which exert local stresses, or these could be synthetic uh, swimmers. So active swimmers are a big topic these days and people have managed to actually trap them in membranes. So what happens when you have um, um, entities that exert stresses, but are net force-free on the, on the membrane? And then, we also do a little bit about, um, you know, crudely speaking, polymer dynamics on the membrane and attached to the membrane. So this is um, kind of trying to replicate ideas of uh, um, actin and microtubules that are near the membrane or other macromolecular entities that are attached to the membrane. For today's talk, we'll mostly stick to the active particles, by which I mean things that exert stresses, but are um, net free, right? you can think of molecular motors as the uh, canonical example. And why do we care? And this comes from <clears throat> a lot of work in the last decade pointing to uh, hydrodynamic disturbance fields within the membrane. So there's an example where these authors looked at uh, enzymes, I think they're supposed to replicate something like a bar enzyme, which does the cyclical enzymatic activity and uh, molecular dynamic simulations show that in the plane of the membrane, now looking from the top of, of this picture, the lipid phase field, if you think of it as a coarse grain fluid, has this kind of clean dipolar flow nature. So you can see that flow gets pushed and flow gets sucked in. 
And when you have two of these, they feel each other's flow. And it's a hydrodynamic disturbance, meaning it's long ranged. So it actually persists over uh, uh, micron scale. Um, people have also kind of thought about how to, how to, um, how to implement ideas of nano swimmers within membranes. So like a canonical three link swimmer in a membrane showing enhanced diffusivity and um, microbes near membrane. So this is work coming out of um, uh, Kate Stibbe's group in Penn um, with the real bacteria or genus particles near membranes, again, showing this clean dipolar flow in the plane of the membrane. And when you have multiple of them, they affect, they, um, they induce disturbance fields on each other. And the key thing is all of these are force-free inclusions, meaning they don't uh, import a net force. So um, to leading order, you can think of them as a force dipole, which kind of shows up in this uh, dipolar flow field as well. And uh, people have thought about large scale consequences of this. This is a work from Courant, from Mike Shelley's group, looking at a model of a whole bunch of ATP synthesis. So these are um, not dipoles in a force dipole sense, but more like a top dipoles, a rotlet if you want. And when you have a bunch of them, there's this coupled interaction between hydrodynamics and sterics uh, or excluded volume, which leads to crystallization. And there's also a hint from the actual measurement from experimental literature. There's work coming out of NCBS in Bangalore, where um, there is a strong uh, hint of uh, uh, aggregation near confinement. And this is a key word that I'll come back to repeatedly. What I mean by that is when you have two cells or a cell and a microtubule or any feature where the uh, extracellular fluid phase is thin or confined, the active, in this case, dynine comes together. So active, um, active entities like to come together and aggregate near confinement. So it's like a chicken and egg story, right? Does their aggregation lead to attachment in this case, or does the attachment somehow have a geometric effect which leads to more confinement? And still very much an open question. And uh, one of the things I'm hoping to address, at least partially through the things I'll tell you today, is uh, the fluency answer to that. What, what exactly does the hydrodynamic flow field look like? And maybe that has a role to play here. All right, so I want to uh, start at a very uh, um, simple level thinking about the mobility problem. So <clears throat> the classic hydrodynamic mobility problem is given a force, what's the velocity? Yeah. And uh, this comes back to finding the mobility from an advanced fluid mechanics class. For example, if you take in a 3D fluids class, you'll tell me that the mobility connects to the diffusivity through the stokes einstein or einstein smith shorsky relation, where the diffusivity relates to one over six pi viscosity radius and the KT to make it a diffusivity. But this is in 3D, there's a sphere in 3D. When it's in a thing that's trapped in a membrane, it's slightly more subtle. And this comes from the fact that it's again, a quasi two dimensional problem. It's not quite 2D and not quite 3D. So if you have a, a kind of a textbook picture like this of a spherical particle that's trapped in a lipid membrane that's being pulled with the force F. And I'm only going to show you one <clears throat> kind of three dimensional phase uh, that nothing changes qualitatively. If you have a three dimensional phase on the other side, it's just a slightly more intuitive picture this way. Um, we can coarse grain it and think of the membrane to be a two-dimensional phase of membrane viscosity, and I'm going to call that eta sub s. Okay, it's a two-dimensional viscosity, meaning its uh, dimensions are one length away from the bulk viscosity. And then if you do this, you can try to solve the fluid dynamics problem. So you solve, let's say, Stokes equations in the bulk, and you, you know, impose the right boundary conditions, and maybe you can get somewhere. And that's what we do. So you can... If it were a clean interface, you would satisfy stress-free, but it's not. It needs, uh, there's a tension gradient, also known as Farangoni, for those of you who are familiar with that. And there's also extra viscous stresses that come from the fact that this has its own viscous response. Now, solving this is not easy, but uh, people have done that um, because you have two dimensional gradients and a third dimensional gradient. You can do that and the classic solution goes back to Safman and Delbrook who showed that the mobility or the diffusivity from this has this form, right? And this is something that has been confirmed and used widely. We're talking about thousands of data points at this point um, over decades. This is really valid when the membrane is very viscous, right? Or the membrane dominated world. And the Safman-Delbrook length shows up. 
Now, it's important to kind of make sense of this link. Um, and this quantifies the difference between 2D and 3D fluid transport. And the way to think about this is if um, the membrane stresses, the membrane viscous stresses go as membrane viscosity times velocity for a characteristic velocity U. But as the bulk viscous stresses grow like bulk viscosity eta times velocity times the length, then at some point, even if you grow, even if you look at a larger and larger membrane, at some point, the integrated stress over a volume catches up. Right? The 3D integration goes as volume, 2D integration goes as surface. At some point, this catches up, even if the membrane is very viscous. And that sets the cutoff. That sets the catch-up length or the Safman delta length. And it's typically of the order of a few microns in, uh, in biological droplets in eukaryotic cells. And that's, that, that becomes important in a few minutes. All right, so now if you know how to solve that, which is something Safman and Delgro did 20, 30 odd years ago, you can begin to think about interactions, what happens due to the motion of one on another. And uh, this is, uh, <clears throat> there are again, many ways to look at this. I'm going to use a point particle approach, meaning we, we are interested in far field interactions. So we are going to um, remove details about uh, the local features of a particle or an inclusion and only think about the, you know, the impulse function or the response to the fact that a particle exists. Right? And the easiest way to attempt that is to uh, find the Green's function or the point force solution. So you perturb it with the point force and find the solution. You can do it um, and you get it in a form that if you're familiar with fluid dynamics, the forms like this are common, but in applied force, you get a velocity. Right? In 3D fluids, this is called a Stokes net. In 2D fluid, it would be called a 2D Stokes net. But here again, it's not quite the 2D problem. So it's not the 2D Stokes net, but it has similar features. And in fact, in some limits, you can retrieve that. Um, maybe it's best to just look at what the flow fields are. Right? You have a particle sitting there. I drag it within the membrane and I'm looking at the flow field in the plane. And uh, typically, when you're membrane dominated, like the picture on the right, that is at length scale that are much smaller than a micron, you get features like this. You get flow fields like this. This is uh, reminiscent of the 2D Stokes net, but not quite. Whereas if you are at longer length scales, um, subphase dominated, where the bulk 3D fluid dominates, you get flow fields like that. And they're clearly different. Right? And what this tells us is that the, uh, the fluid that you suspend your uh, vesicle in, if it's a GUV experiment, or if it's uh, the properties of the phospholipid that comprises the bilayer, uh, tunes <coughs> the flow field within the membrane. And this also affects kind of hydrodynamic interactions. How, how does the motion of one affect the other? And depending on the streamlines, the way particles might approach each other, their effective hydrodynamic pseudo potential is different. And uh, you can also kind of quantitatively get a sense of this by looking at the shape of these functions, A and B, that make up the interaction. And in the membrane dominated limit, which is uh, when you have things that look like a 2D flow, the Safman limit, they grow as logarithms, which is, uh, which is obvious to those who think a lot about the Safman problem. Whereas if you are in the subphase dominated, uh, limit, where things decay algebraically. Right? So you get this uh, flow field which has a clear uh, dipolar feature, uh, uh, not quite dipolar, but the um, radial feature is what I should say. And this again is something people have uh, captured using two-point microbiology. You can, you can find two-point correlations between moving particles. And these data points are from um, Eric Weeks's group where they actually did this on album in limits. All right, so all of this about particles that are driven, but what I was getting to is that we are interested in active, uh, active entities or active particles, which are force and top free. Right? There's no net force on it. And again, there are many ways to think about it, but perhaps the most pedagogic and uh, elementary way is to think of them as the simplest possible uh, multipole setup, which is force free and which is a dipole. Without thinking about, for example, the reconfiguration of a membrane inclusion. In this case, you have forces pointing, equal forces pointing in opposite directions. And in this case, you can uh, think of the point dipole to be generating the flow that is a result of a Green's function acting on a 
ports and the green function acting on the other ports separated by a small distance, which I'm calling L here. Okay? So P is the orientation direction. So you have two forces pointing equal and opposite way. Uh, you can find uh, this, you can Taylor expand this and essentially get this as a, a gradient of the Green's function acting on the orientations. And what's important here is the dipole strength, I'm calling it sigma, which is just the force times the length. You can think of the typical size of a active motor protein and the force that a motor protein exerts. And it has to be a few 10 kts, okay? So one to 100 kt is the typical value of sigma. And uh, you can look at the flow fields, the membrane flow fields that such dipoles generate. So again, if your subphase is dominated, meaning your membrane is very uh, weakly viscous, you get flow fields like that. Whereas in the typical membrane at length scales that are less than a micron, the flow field that, that each uh, inclusion or each uh, active protein generates looks uh, very clearly like a dipole. Okay, there's only radial flow lines, whereas here there are curved streamlined system. So what does this mean in terms of interactions? You, you, you would like, if you want aggregation, you would like more of those curved streamlines, meaning you need to somehow make the uh, the bulk viscous contributions dominate, you need to you know, amplify them. And one way to do that is to introduce uh, confinement. So what I mean by that is if you have a neighboring membrane or a substrate or another vesicle coming close together, the way the bulk viscous stress is uh, decay is, uh, is a metric of the 3D bulk stresses. So if, you, if they decay quickly because of a no slip condition there, the gradient of the velocity field, which tells you how strong the viscous forces are, is very high, and therefore you're amplifying the stresses. So confined cases can amplify the fluid layer here. It's like thin film theory and lubrication theory for those of you who, who work with fluid mechanics. That amplifies the 3D stresses and thereby pushes it into a region where the uh, bulk phase, is, the bulk phase uh, contribution dominates, meaning if you calculate the appropriate Green's function, these are different now and also depend on age. The effective velocity in the confined case will be one that favors the bulk fluid mechanics. So if I uh, go ahead and uh, look at the velocity field generated by such a dipole in an infinite surface, this is something you saw before, but as you keep confining it, you'll see that it approaches the case where there are these curved streamlines. In fact, in the limit when H is zero, you get the case which is a perfect, the flow field due to a perfect force dipole, like in potential flow. And uh, essentially what we're discovering here is that there's a transition from the traditional Safman length, right, the few microns, to a smaller length, it's got a screening effect due to the, due to the confinement, and it's screened in this form. And in fact, this suggests that when there is confinement, the flow field changes and the way proteins are active motors come together is different because the hydrodynamics are different, the interactions are different. And uh, we can examine this more closely by essentially calculating the velocity of interaction in the uh, membrane dominated, where a deep subface limit and the confined limit. And clearly the streamlines are different. So presumably the pair interactions are different too. So I want to take a couple of minutes to explore the pair interactions carefully. It's, a, it's more a nonlinear dynamics problem than a biophysics problem, but it sheds some interesting light on what's really happening. So we can explore this, for example, by setting up a, a pair problem like this one here, where uh, you have two dipoles and the red arrows are supposed to indicate their uh, orientation. Right? So I'm going to track the orientations of both, call them theta one and theta two and the distance between them. And they're only moving because of the uh, interactions with each other, right? And uh, if you let it run, you get this kind of interesting nonlinear oscillator behavior because the translation and orientation are coupled. Right? The translation pushes or pulls the other and each one also rotates in the velocity field supplied by the other uh, via Fakten's laws. And uh, this coupling leads to this interesting nonlinear oscillator problem. And this is the unconfined case. Whereas if you move to the confined case where you have a substrate nearby, and I'll play two videos and I can tell you, and you can believe me that regardless of the initial condition, 
they do something that looks like they're going far away, but eventually find a configuration where they get attracted to each other. When I say attraction, I mean a hydrodynamic attraction, right? So pseudo potential or something. And uh, th this is the case that we always see, and we can dig a little deeper into the nonlinear dynamics of the problem. We can find the uh, rate of change of distance and the angles and plot a phase diagram of theta one and theta two. This is a bit uh, tricky to interpret, so I'll walk you through it. The lines or the quivers are theta one dot and theta two dot. So it's a velocity or that rate of change of theta one and theta two. It's a phase portrait. The colors indicate the magnitude of the uh, velocity of approach or separation, right? So red is approach, green is separation. So if you enter this kind of diamond in the middle, you're moving towards each other. Outside that, you're moving away from each other. And it's in theta, so it's periodic. And this is an interesting nonlinear dynamics problem because you can explore the fixed points. When you're right there, there's a configuration where two dipoles are parallel to each other. Right? It's a saddle node. And uh, the way the dipoles pull fluid from the side, it's a saddle node that's an attractor. Right? You could look at other fixed points, the corners, which are also saddle nodes, but now the dipoles are facing each other. So they're pushing each other. So it's a separating or a repelling saddle node. There are also fixed points at the cor corners of the, of the diamond shape. These are nonlinear centers, meaning these are the configurations where you have a perpendicular configuration, the distance doesn't change. But any perturbation away from the center leads to kind of curved streamlines within the phase plane. So let me uh, let me show you that by actually playing the video that I showed you before, but also with the phase portrait. So here, same video, but the point here tracks the movement in the phase plane. You can see that it hops in and out of the region of uh, trapping, as I call it. So when you're in the gray zone, you are coming together. When you're outside the gray zone, you're going separated, and in a deterministic system, you just keep going on with this nonlinear oscillator cycle. And you can do some more, you can estimate the frequency, you can perturb around a, a nonlinear center and find the eigenvalues, right? you can find the Jacobian of the system and find the eigenvalues. That tells you it's a purely imaginary, meaning it doesn't grow or decay, it just oscillates. And from that, you can find the, uh, uh, essentially the time period of oscillation. And as expected, it turns out to be effective viscous resistance to dipole strength. You can estimate time scales from this. And uh, you can examine the same thing for the confined case where the phase portrait changes. You're always being sucked into this region of trapping, as I call it. And uh, what that means is that in a, um, maybe the animation is most um, illustrative, you always flow into this gray region where you get trapped. So once you get into that, the distance between the two is always decreasing until you snap together. Of course, when you're really close to each other, hydrodynamics is not the only thing that matters. You have to worry about local electrostatic effects. For the simulations, we just set up a short range repulsion that keeps them from essentially you know, colliding into each other. All right, what does this mean in large scale systems? You can do uh, point particle simulations. These are Brownian dynamic simulations. When you have unconfined systems, you get this uh, um, interesting kind of touch and go kind of mechanism. These are periodic simulations. What you see is that they, they don't really form aggregates. They just uh, keep moving away from each other because of the pair dynamics I showed you. Whereas if you're in a confined membrane, they, they keep aggregating particles until they form system spanning clusters. Right? And we have thought about this in a continuum fashion too. There's really no length scale associated with this. It's system spanning membranes. And I can show you, I think, another simulation where uh, yeah, you have a larger system size and you just build up clusters that span the system. So it's a zero wave number instability. If you want to think of it that way, uh, you can explore the effect of uh, basically any parameter I showed you. I'm not going to show you all the statistics of it. But for example, if you think about uh, thermal noise, this is a thermal noise and an effective temperature that's uh, 0.01, I think, which is comparable to the actual uh, system. And there's still, uh, there, there are clusters that form. They don't persist as much. They melt easily, but clusters do form. And what we're doing with this now, moving forward, is uh, pushing into regions of mixing and membrane reorganization. So this is stuff uh, that my graduate student, who's I think in the audience, has been doing, thinking about how the motion of these particles uh, 
change the local lipid field. So that we start with something that was uh, separated and examine how the lipid field reorganizes due to the activity and how the reorganization changes when it's deep versus uh, confined. Right? You get this clear feature associated with a confined flow that enhances mixing or reorganization. We're quantifying this using ideas of mixing norm. Um, the other thing that we have been working on is um, non-trivial rheology. So membranes are not necessarily simple Newtonian fluids. So what happens when your viscosity is non-constant? What happens when it depends on another property? For example, the concentration of lipid. The math of this is pretty involved, but uh, we can do it. We can do it using ideas of uh, what's called reciprocal theorem. What happens uh, is that you find excess disturbance field around each particle that tends to line up things, right? So for example, if you have a pair problem, the dashed circles indicate what would happen in a clean Newtonian membrane of driven particles, whereas the solid colors indicate what happens when you have this effect, the effect of non-constant viscosity. Things tend to line up in chains because they're pulling in to the top and bottom in the direction of motion. And if you have large scale systems, you get this kind of collective crystallization effect, which are driven by this local uh, chaining phenomenon, right? So I think I've taken up uh, the 25 plus minutes. So with this, I will leave my conclusion slide back here and uh, I'll happily take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Harry, for a wonderful talk. I'm again clapping on behalf of all the audience. Uh, so we have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is from Ashok Prasad. Uh, what would be the effect of cortical actin and the spectrin layer under the membrane in cells and the crowd and the interior of the cell? Wouldn't yeah. it limit hydrodynamic interactions to possibly nanometer distances within the membrane? Yeah, so... Um... Uh, can I... Can I Go ask, ahead. can I just add a supplement to it? Sure. Which is that uh, this, I asked this question before you started talking about uh, confinement. Okay. Uh, and so I guess basically what in one way, what I'm, I'm kind of surprised that your interactions are system size because wouldn't, wouldn't they be limited by the screening length? Yes. And in a sense, what I'm saying here is that isn't, isn't all of this stuff creating a very short screening length for hydrodynamic interactions? Yeah, so it is. So the system spanning, you have to be careful when you think about the system spanning effect because interactions are limited to screening length, but all you need is two particles to create it. So as long as there's a neighbor which is within a screening length, order of a screening length away from the cluster, it still gets attracted to the cluster. So it's a, it's a subtlety there where the interactions are still local to that screening length, mm -hmm. but uh, in, a, in a pairwise sense, that's pulling together. But but what you raised earlier with the actin cortex and uh, you know, um, you know um, things that are stagnant within the membrane, that's that's more critical, I think. And that's something we are actually digging into right now. We we're thinking about caging effects. You know, what happens when you know, this, is, this is like a theoretician's dream problem, right? It's perfectly infinite flat membrane. Obviously that's not the, not the case. We are thinking mm -hmm. about uh, issues of um, what happens when one of these is, uh, um, uh, I mean, we think about it in a caging sense. So what happens when you have essentially walls, essentially only narrow pathways where things can diffuse uh -huh. through. Uh -huh. and, uh, it's, uh, it's more difficult. That's the choral more... diffusion picture, right? Which is what yeah. people believe. Diffusion, yeah. yeah, so you're allowed to only locally diffuse a bit and then take big jumps like Levi flights. Uh, that's a, mm -hmm. definitely the direction we are heading into, yes. All right, so we have reached an hour. So I think we're going to conclude here with a formal uh, um, presentation. So I want to thank again both speakers for, you know, wonderful talks.